and a welcome to the world today. I'm Amarachi Ubari. And I'm Minister Tomoka. First, the headlines. Finland's leaders announce intention to join NATO Defence Alliance without delay. Application for membership expected next week after Parliament's approval. North Korea confirms the first COVID-19 outbreak imposes nationwide lockdown just as new cases of COVID in South Africa crosses 10,000 for the first time since January. Plus, plane carrying 11 passengers crashes in central Cameroon. Rescue efforts are ongoing. Friendly steps. That's how the Kremlin is describing Finland's plans to join NATO, which it says is a definitely a threat to Russia, and that the expansion of a military, the military bloc will not make Europe or the world more stable. Speaking to reporters on a conference call, Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov said the steps taken by Finland to join NATO were a cause for regret and a reason to impose a symmetrical response. Finland's leaders have said the country should apply to join NATO Defence Alliance without delay. The country's parliament is expected to approve the plans next week, after which the application process can begin, though joining can take a year. It is said that Sweden could follow suit within days. But here's, happening in, here's what else is happening in uh, Ukraine. A thousand bodies have been recovered around the capital, Kyiv. In recent weeks, the UN's human rights chief, Michelle Bachelet, says many killings the organization is looking at may amount to war crimes. She told the Geneva-based Human Rights Council the scale of unlawful killings uncovered was shocking. Meanwhile, Ukrainian troops have been continuing their counteroffensive around Kharkiv, Ukraine's second largest city. According to Ukraine's military, Russian troops have been pushed back so far uh, that the artillery, they say, is no longer in range of the city's center. Here's more on ground. Ukrainian Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba began an official visit to Germany today where he met with leaders of Chancellor Olaf Scholz's Social Democrats. Kuleba was later scheduled to meet representatives of Foreign Minister Annalena Baerbock's Green Party before heading north, where he is expected to attend a G7 Foreign Minister's meeting to discuss the war in Ukraine. Germany currently holds the rotating G7 presidency. For Ukraine's foreign minister, no alternatives to European integration of Ukraine will be acceptable. This, we firmly believe that it will be in the best interests of Europe to grant Ukraine EU candidacy status in late June at the summit of the European Council. And then discussions on the further strategic development of Europe and how it should be structured can continue. It will take time. I don't think Germany perfectly understands what, uh, what, uh, where this discussion will bring everyone to. So this is an open discussion. But EU candidacy status must be granted. Meanwhile, Finns today welcomed their country's decision to apply to join NATO without delay. President Sauli Ninisto and Prime Minister Sanna Marin said in a joint statement they hoped that the steps still needed for a decision would be taken rapidly within the next few days. Finland's neighbor Sweden is also expected to follow suit. It's great news. It's about time. I have really waiting this this happening happening in a long time and i really i, I really i'm really really happy about that and i think it's a great thing because it will bring more safety to finland against russian aggression and it also shows russian that there is consequences what you do and now Finland can make it decision by itself without any Russian attempts. Well, I think uh, we should because uh, 
this is the best security uh, best security uh, solution this time and uh, Russia has betrayed us so many times now again and it's it's absolutely that we should uh, change NATO join NATO because you know uh, Putin started it so he he is affecting that we are joining NATO now yes, that's put this for actually the whole thing two and two three months almost now the Ukrainian people are suffering and everything in response the Kremlin says that Finland's move to join NATO was definitely a threat to Russia and that the expansion of the military bloc would not make Europe or the world more stable. Speaking to reporters on a conference call, Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov said the steps taken by Finland to join NATO were cause for regret and a reason to impose a symmetrical response. According to the UN human rights chief, Thousands of bodies have been recovered in the area of the Ukrainian capital, Kiev, in recent weeks, and that many of the violations it is verifying since the Russian invasion may amount to war crimes. Michelle Bachelet told the Geneva-based Human Rights Council via a video address that the scale of unlawful killing, including indications of summary executions in areas to the north of Kiev, is shocking. The Human Rights Council will decide on today whether to task investigators with an official probe into the events that occurred in Kiev and other regions in February and March. Over in Zaporizhia, doctors at a military hospital in the southeastern city have had to start staying on site for days at a time as waves of casualties are rushed to them for treatment from frontline areas nearby. The UN human rights body cautions the number of civilian casualties is likely much higher due to the inaccessibility of areas with intense fighting. They do the stabilization, the first care, and then they send them to the west to be taken care. And like this, they are ready to take some, uh, some more for the following days. And actually, we can see that these this last few days, the number uh, increase. It appears there is no immediate sign of relief for Ukraine's health system. Joining us now is international affairs analyst Dele Ogun. He is in the UK. Dele, thank you for joining us on the program today. Uh, pleasure to be here. Let's begin with developments from Ukraine and the possible new members that may be joining NATO. Finland's foreign minister says Russia's invasion of Ukraine was the turning point for his country, upending decades of public support for non-military alignment. Interestingly, uh, Pekka Havisto used to be an outspoken advocate of closer engagement and cooperation with Russia. What do you make of this turnaround? Well, there, there's um, a, a lot of group think going on in this world of ours, and group think is very dangerous. We need much more independent thinking. Uh, this is the problem with gangs. When you have a war gang like NATO, that's so powerful. Uh, it, it's raison d'etre is war. And um, recruiting more and more members into the gang can only expose the rest of us uh, to the trials and tribulations uh, of conflict. It's curious that it is now uh, that Finland uh, now sees the need uh, to join NATO. I'm not aware of any action overt action, or indeed covert, uh, that the Russians are said to have taken against the Finnish people, uh, such as to rationalize uh, the sudden rush towards NATO's arms. What I rather suspect is that NATO, being a very powerful organization, uh, has a lot of leverage. Um, and economics is a big part of that exercise. And I suspect it's much more pressure uh, that has been put on uh, the Finnish government in order for them to uh, uh, align. We must remember that when Zelensky of Ukraine uh, was running for office, uh, the agenda that he sold to his people was warmer, closer relationship 
with Russia. Uh, what changed? It seems a remarkable echo of the Finnish position. Uh, as you just said, historically, they were always advocating a warmer, more constructive uh, relationship with Russia. And then all of a sudden, everybody's changing course. Uh, gangs are always dangerous. Uh, war gangs are particularly dangerous. And uh, we are in a very difficult period uh, where we need much more uh, many more non-aligned voices uh, speaking out. Uh, I don't trust the leadership of this world uh, to uh, the European powers. Uh, they've been responsible for far too many wars uh, between themselves, which have dragged the rest of the world into conflict uh, over and over and over again. And it seems that we're at that crossroads uh, once more. And there's a real prospect that other parts of the world uh, will be dragged in in due course. A pretty interesting analysis there. Um, NATO chief Jens Stoltenberg is ready to welcome Finland and even Sweden warmly into the alliance, uh, where, of course, members are pledging to defend each other. Do you wonder why, you know, the same courtesy is not being granted to Ukraine? Well, uh, Ukrainians have to understand that they are the sacrificial lamb. This is a nuclear chess game uh, that has been played. And in, like in uh, any chess move, there are pawns that you will sacrifice in order to make the larger strategic moves. Uh, Ukrainians are clearly have been identified as the uh, first uh, sacrificial pawns, uh, which would then make it easier uh, for others to... Uh, make the move into NATO. But my expectation uh, is that if the Finns, because they do share a border uh, with Russia, uh, and they are a significant country, not like Latvia or Estonia, those are, were not perceived uh, by Russia as a threat, even though they do border uh, 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 Russia. Uh, if Finland, uh, that is a significant uh, state, uh, was to uh, make the move of joining NATO, you would expect consistency from the Russians um, in the same way as they've uh, dealt with the uh, the Ukrainian situation. And, and Finland's application to join NATO will be presented before its parliament next week. There, of course, is the possibility that parliament might reject that, and this is what uh, you would advise, wouldn't you? Well, it's certainly in the interests of the Finns. They've seen, do they really want what's happening in Ukraine to ha happen to them? They, the uh, Finnish people have to sit back and reflect and don't trust their parliamentarians. Uh, parliamentarians can be gangsters in these exercises. Once they've got the mandate, they go off and cut the deals and do whatever they like. It's really for the people of Finland uh, to reflect and ask themselves, uh, what is it uh, that... Uh, Russia has done to Finnish people, or what threats has it made uh, to Finland uh, in order now to justify the move uh, into NATO? Because rest assured, as I've said before, if you are proposing to join a gang whose purpose appears to be uh, war against Russia, and I say that because why was the invitation when Russia applied to join NATO? If NATO was just a club whereby we will all defend ourselves, why was Russia's application to join NATO rejected or not encouraged? Uh, so it is a chess game, as I said, that they're playing, and the Finnish people need to ask themselves uh, whether it would actually advance their course uh, to join such a war gang. Interestingly, we, we just saw a report about some Finnish uh, who say that, you know, looking at what is happening in Ukraine. They don't want it to happen to Finland, and so they are in support. Uh, but neighboring Sweden, the public support for joining the alliance seems to be a uh, little less enthusiastic. Why do you think this is the case? Well, Sweden, as always, uh, if you think back about to the First World War and the Second World War, uh, Sweden maintained a neutral position of neutrality, and that neutrality was respected. Uh, Sweden doesn't actually border uh, Russia in any way. Uh, so, um, again, uh, I'm not aware of 
anything that can be pointed to as being Russian threats against the Swedish people or Sweden. And so uh, with their history of neutrality, I would expect the Swedes uh, to uh, exercise a great degree of caution and, um, and put their own interests uh, at the fore rather than simply uh, following the crowd. As I said in earlier, there's far too much group think around. Uh, you need much more independent thinking, not just at the governmental level, but each and every one of us, citizens of this world, uh, why should uh, these characters who have been responsible for so many wars, uh, conflagrations that have consumed the world, why should they be playing nuclear chess uh, with our lives? Well, um, NATO, uh, sorry, Russia says it's preparing, you know, for these countries, um, they will be receiving, you know, the same measures that have been meted out on Ukraine. I'm talking about Finland and Sweden. Uh, what do you think that will be like, you know, Russia's uh, reaction to uh, Sweden and Finland's final, when they finally become members of NATO? What, what would Russia's reaction, you know, the promise that he says, and should Russia still be, you know, watched when it comes to uh, this sort of situation? Well, the reaction will, of course, come before they join NATO, because, of course, once they join NATO, uh, if Russian action was to be taken at that point, after they've become members, uh, then NATO would have to attack Russia. <laughs> and then we'll be back in the world war stage. Um, so uh, any action, just like the Ukraine situation, any action that Russia uh, was to take uh, would be taken uh, before they actually become members. And uh, again, I repeat myself, uh, it is for these countries, and particularly the citizens. Governments are far too irresponsible these days because democracy has broken down uh, right across the board. It's the power of money that is actually governing our world. And citizens need to, if you like, take back control and speak out uh, and voice uh, their concerns about these developments uh, before it is too late. And Europe will never be the same again when this war is over, that's for sure. So to what extent will these power blocks that already exist, to what extent will they hold? Well, they've gone, haven't they? <laughs> Many things have gone uh, already. Um, globalization is over. When you think about all the economic sanctions that have been in imposed uh, on Russia, complete shutdown of the financial networks that were joining the world up, that's gone. The world has been divided now very much between the, uh, the Germanic uh, peoples of the West uh, and the rest. So you've got the Slavs uh, on one side and the rest of the world, and you've got uh, the Germanic peoples on the other side. Uh, and all their offshoots in England and, um, and America and all, all the rest of that. What they've succeeded in doing, they've moved the Berlin Wall from Berlin now to Ukraine. There we were all celebrating the collapse of the, or the taking down of the Berlin Wall to bring peoples together, uh, mutual coexistence, living in peace. And I remember the celebrations uh, when the wall came down. But these characters have reconstructed it because war is their way of life. Uh, and this is why we Africans really need to step up because as long as the world is run by those whose DNA is simply warfare, they sold us the narrative that Africans were always killing themselves. Uh, <laughs> these ones are always killing themselves and not just themselves, they end up killing others, the rest of us in the process. And now we're at the risk of nuclear war. Uh, Africa really has to step up to the mark. Otherwise, they will drag us in once more. Dilo, it's been a real pleasure speaking with you. Some very interesting analysis on the issue. Thank you again. Uh, thank you very much. Coming up on The World Today.
Welcome back to the world today. We're going around the world now. The next Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, Chogham for short, may be weeks away, but preparations are in place for Rwanda, this year's host, to welcome leaders from member countries. Chogham 2022 will be the 26th meeting of the Heads of Government of the Commonwealth Nations. It was originally scheduled for June 26th to the 27th, but was postponed twice by various fora. Now it is set to hold from Monday, June 20th, to June 26th at the Kigali Convention Center. Right, but we have joining us now the Rwandan ambassador to Nigeria, Ambassador Stanislas Kamanzi, to put some spotlight on it and to talk about other issues uh, in Rwanda. Ambassador, thank you for being here. Pleasure joining in. And you're coming at a time, you know, when we're also discussing, you know, the war in Ukraine, interestingly, which is affecting everywhere else in the world. How has Rwanda been affected by uh, this Russian invasion of Ukraine, or do you see it as an invasion? Well, it, um, it's a war, definitely. It was an invasion, and uh, uh, I, well, it, it's due to, to, to problems that uh, are of concern to both Russia and Ukraine, and uh, it has to be seen as such. Uh, for the impact, definitely, Africa. Uh, and Rwanda, uh, particularly, have been uh, have been um, uh, affected by the the crisis. Uh, you know that uh, currently, uh, most African countries are suffering escalating uh, prices uh, of fuel. Uh, we have a problem of uh, uh, shortage of supply of wheat in many countries, uh, say a country like Egypt is suffering significantly. Uh, also shortage in supply of fertilizers for uh, African countries that, uh, uh, that are active in, uh, in uh, intensive farming, and Rwanda is among those. So the impact is here, or not to mention uh, other problems even to international diplomacy, uh, the concern various countries and Rwanda is among those. Yeah, you mentioned the, the hike in food and fuel prices. Mm. Is it the same in Rwanda? You know, because I know the country itself is quite self-sufficient. So um, what's the situation on the ground, though? What are you hearing? Well, uh, our strategies have uh, 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 provided for uh, managing crises like this, this one. So as much as the impact is, uh, can be uh, sensed, but measures were taken to ensure that uh, uh, there is a caution uh, possible uh, to ensure transition from uh, this situation to a better, uh, to, to a situation where, of normalcy, if I may say, say it that way. Yeah, and this year, uh, Rwanda will be hosting uh, Chogom. Mm -hmm. It'll be the first for the country since uh, its membership uh, to the Commonwealth on, in 2009. How significant a time is it for Rwanda? Indeed, it's, uh, it's quite exciting. Um, Rwanda will be the very first uh, uh, country who, which is not uh, a I mean, which is, which is not a former colony of, uh, of, of the UK. And this connection, we, we, we you know, we, uh, it's an opportunity for Rwanda uh, to showcase uh, its dynamism in a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a member of the Commonwealth. Uh, so we, we, we're looking forward to welcoming all, all, all the countries, members of the organization. It will be for us an opportunity to showcase uh, that uh, our capital city, Chigari, is um, a, a destination for uh, meetings, uh, incentives, uh, conferences and exhibitions, which is uh, commonly known as MICE. So it's a big opportunity to open up to the world and uh, uh, to permit an open discussion on uh, matters that have, are of concerns to uh, the Commonwealth membership indeed, but also to other countries as well.
I haven't heard a lot about Kigali. Um, Marcia, I don't know if you've been, but I would I like to be. <laughs> sure, you're welcome to, okay. welcome to go. But then I wanted to ask about the advantages of the membership, because we know that, um, I mean, Rwanda before 2009 was not a member of the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. Well, for a nation uh, to, 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 to be a member of such an important organization, definitely there are uh, benefits uh, for Rwanda. Uh, we could open up or, con or be connected to a broader, um, uh, a broader, uh, uh, how do I put it, to a broader spectrum as far as uh, cooperating with the nations in Africa, but also beyond Africa is concerned. Uh, we managed to, 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 to move from our traditional partners to a bigger number of partners and to share their experience, which inspire the current dynamics of transformation of the country. Um, speaking of which, the first batch of illegal migrants mm -hmm. are set to be sent to Rwanda following the decision. Um, I think this was uh, this week. What will be the modalities for their arrival? Well, I want to first of all clarify that uh, for the time being, we're not clear as to when that first batch will be coming but we are prepared to definitely receive it. Modalities uh, set uh, include provision of uh, a reception center through which they will pass, uh, they will pass so that they can be uh, properly guided uh, regarding uh, modalities for submitting application, asylum, asylum for, uh, asyl, uh, you know, application for asylum. And, uh, uh, once that is uh, uh, completed, they will be directed to a place of accommodation and uh, be given, uh, be provided with all facilitation to, to settle, uh, pending the time, uh, those who have been uh, uh, identified as qualifying for asylum uh, will be, will be uh, moved to communities in, a, uh, in a, I would say, permanent accommodation uh, facil facilities that uh, have been prepared. Those who won't qualify also will be facilitated to, uh, to be, uh, will be accepted to, to, to stay uh, as refugees and uh, even, uh, even also uh, provided with uh, necessary facilitation for them to, you know, to settle in, to settle in, in, a, in that capacity under that status. I'm just wondering, what if there are Nigerians in, in that batch that are coming back? What will happen to them? Well, they, they are welcome like any other, any other uh, citizens of uh, other countries. Uh, they will be welcome to, you know, under the conditions that will be provided, that uh, have been provided for. Okay, and you know we can't we can't uh, of course uh, complete this interview without asking you where we are at when it comes to Nigeria Rwanda relations. Oh, they're fantastic. Uh, the most uh, you know the you know the the, the most uh, up to date uh, highlight in that regard is the recent signing of uh, uh, the establishment of a joint permanent commission. Uh, which happened in Chigari and um, uh, which was attended on the part of Nigeria by the uh, Nigerian Minister of State, uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And uh, uh, that uh, the agreement that was sign, signed uh, 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 ha has or shows uh, the main uh, sectors of cooperation that uh, emphasis will be put on uh, as in the continuation of what's, the, what's in existence, but mm -hmm. also other sectors that uh, will be tapped so that uh, uh, cooperation can, can grow uh, to, a, to, to, to more elevated heights, if I may say so. Uh, but I, I must tell you that uh, we're very glad that uh, uh, starting from highest level, uh, our leaders have been in sync on matters that concern Africa, that concern the, the world, but also on matters of common interest as far as the two countries, uh, the two, the, the two countries uh, are concerned.
No, no doubt about that. Uh, back to uh, Chogum now. The theme for this year is delivering a common future. Mm -hmm. What does that mean for Rwanda? How are mm. you interpreting this? It means a lot. Um, uh, well, I will start, for instance, from the perspective of Africa, uh, where, of course, Rwanda is. Uh, our countries are, on, in, or are or should be on a dynamic of, of trans transformation. And the, and, and the theme actually, you know, summarized it very well. Uh, we, we, we're looking forward to tapping the, exist, the existing opportunities to create uh, frameworks for the people of our nations to thrive, to benefit from what the world has to offer, uh, to lead be, 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 be better livelihoods. And uh, that can only happen through uh, uh, synergies among all nations where successes can be shared, where failures can be uh, tackled, mm -hmm. and uh, also uh, uh, with, with, with um, a, how do I put it, with a, 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 with, with a sense of uh, uh, agency to also uh, collaborate in uh, uh, tackling the identified problems to date. We might cite, for instance, the problems relevant to climate change. We might uh, cite the problems relevant to global health. You know, climate change, global health, we, we've been, uh, uh, and we still are through this uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, that uh, has affected uh, humanity from, you know, from a 360 perspective, uh, stalling activity, you know, economic activities, uh, creating uh, anxieties as far as uh, planning for the future is concerned. So the theme actually uh, uh, broadly uh, addresses those uh, with the provision of tapping what's, you know, what is uh, available to build uh, a stronger capacity to move on, to, uh, to, 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 to create better livelihoods for, uh, for, for, for human community globally, just to put it, to put it shorter. Yeah, definitely, no, the whole world will be looking forward to uh, the Chogun meeting coming up later in June especially uh, in Kigali. I was going to ask if there is anything like a Rwandan jollof rice, Kigali jollof rice. <laughs> oh, there? there are a couple of uh, Nigerian joints in Kigali. <laughs> okay, so And it, definitely they do so jollof rice. So it's Nigerian jollof rice. Just checking. They do jollof rice, and uh, when you go, you want to miss it, you'll be, you know, you'll be satisfied. We appreciate your time. Thank you so much, Rwandan ambassador to Nigeria, Ambassador Stanislas Kamanzi. Thank you for joining us on The World Today. Thank you very much for hosting me. Another related news. Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, more than 100 migrants, though, have protested outside an immigration station in the southern Mexican city of Oaxaca, demanding humanitarian visas to allow them go safely through and continue on their journey to the United States. Most of them are coming from Central America, denouncing uh, they arrived in Oaxaca on Tuesday from Tapachula on Mexico's southern border after being transferred by immigration officials who had assured them that they would be granted humanitarian visas. Right, the migrants have been holding protests demanding their cases be expedited to move freely in Mexico. They've also denounced a Mexican government crackdown that has kept them in prisons, they say, in the country's south. Tens of thousands of migrants flee their home countries each year, attempting to reach the United States, but many of them also seek refuge and protection in Mexico. Meanwhile, the Red Cross says a Spanish Coast Guard today rescued 183 migrants off the coast of the Canary Islands at two 
Coast Guard vessels arrived at the port of Aguiguin in Gran Canaria as early as five in the morning, carrying dozens of migrants. The first boat transported 34 men rescued from the Atlantic Ocean to the Gran Canaria port, while the second vessel carried 46 people. Another two dinghies carrying 103 migrants were also rescued near the island of Lanzarote on Tuesday morning. Thousands of migrants do make the perilous journey to Europe. At least 4,400 people were lost at sea, attempted to reach Spain. A total of 22,316 migrants crossed by boats to the Canary Islands last year after 23,271 made the crossing in 2020. Let's head on now to the UK where Prime Minister Boris Johnson um, and his cabinet met to discuss how to deliver the government's levelling up policy to tackle social and economic inequality. Mr Johnson's government is under pressure to provide more support to households to tackle soaring bills for energy and other essentials that have already caused a near record fall in consumer sentiment. Economists say geographical disparities in health, education and incomes a large and persistent with cities such as London, Oxford and Cambridge, accused of sucking funding and talent out of the rest of Britain. Successive British governments, both Conservative and Labour, have sought for decades to address inequality by devolving part of Westminster to the region, but with only limited success. Saying in Britain, police say they've now made more than 100 referrals for fines as part of their investigation into lockdown rule breaking at gatherings held in the Prime Minister's official residence, number 10 Downing Street, during the COVID pandemic. The Prime Minister has apologised for receiving a fine in April for breaking lockdown rules by attending a gathering in his office to celebrate his birthday, but has refused to resign over it. And while he could receive further fines for other gatherings, his spokesperson says Mr Johnson has not received another fine. Police are investigating 12 gatherings held at Downing Street and the Cabinet Office sought an internal inquiry, found Mr Johnson's staff and had enjoyed alcohol fueled parties with Johnson himself attending a few events himself. We'll take another break now on The World Today. Still ahead. A luxury London store is launching real-time crypto price tags. We'll know more about this when we return. Stay with us. Welcome back. In a very rare move, North Korean authorities are asking the international community for help after it officially reported its first COVID-19 outbreak. The rare demonstration of urgency of the situation comes as North Korea describes the outbreak as the gravest national emergency and ordered a national lockdown, with state media saying an Omicron variant has been detected in the capital, Pyongyang. North Korea had never confirmed a COVID infection before Thursday, although South Korean and U.S. officials have said there could have been earlier cases in the isolated country, given its trade and travel with China before it sealed its border to block the virus in early 2020. North Korea recently held two large state anniversary events, including a full-scale military parade at the end of April. In photo sessions with Kim Jong-un, large crowds of party workers and students were not wearing masks and were in close proximity to the leader. North Korea had declined vaccine supplies from the COVAX sharing program and the Sinovac biotech vaccine from China, possibly leaving the vast majority of people in a relatively young country exposed to high risk of infection. The American flag is flying at half a star for the White House as the country marks more than a million COVID-19 related deaths. President Joe Biden issued a proclamation that U.S. flags be lowered on all public buildings and military facilities until sunset on May 16. The milestone represents about one death for every 327 Americans, or more than the entire population of San Francisco or Seattle. 
That's the highest official toll in the world, though the World Health Organization believes the true death toll may be much higher elsewhere. The U.S. has recorded more than 80 million COVID cases out of its 330 million population. Meanwhile, 6.7 million people around the world have died from COVID. with the coronavirus but here in africa the number of new cases of the virus in south africa has crossed 10,000 for the first time since january the national institute for communicable disease reported 10,017 new cases on wednesday with health authorities warning the country may be entering a fifth wave of infections experts had previously warned a fifth wave could start during the southern hemisphere winter months sometime in may or june South Africa has recorded the most coronavirus cases and deaths on the African continent. Just under 50% of the adult population have received at least one dose of the COVID vaccine, with 45% of adults being fully vaccinated. The pace of the vaccine rollouts has slowed in recent months, with officials warning that shots risk being discarded. We're in Sri Lanka now. The streets of Colombo are calm as businesses close uh, as the crisis hit on the island nation uh, we started its curfew at 2 p.m local time today local business owners said they are frustrated by the resumption of the curfew hundreds of people had earlier thronged the main bus station of the commercial capital to return to their hometowns after authorities lifted an indefinite curfew at 7 a.m for people to buy food items and stock up on essentials Sri Lanka is battling its worst economic crisis since independence. Violence erupted on Monday after supporters of former Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaska, the president's elder brother, attacked an anti-government protest camp in Colombo. Well, back in North Korea, which has fired a ballistic missile off its east coast, according to the South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un convened a meeting of the ruling workers' parties, uh, powerful Boltiro uh, Bolitburo today, ordering a strict lockdown nationwide and also the mobilization of emergency reserve medical supplies after discovering the case of covid Yesterday, the U.S. called out China and Russia for opposing further United Nations actions on North Korea, warning that the Security Council cannot stay silent any longer as Pyongyang prepares for a seventh nuclear test. The suspected launch from the Sinan area of North Korea's capital also came two days after the inauguration of South Korea's new president, Yoon suk yeol in Seoul. Yoon's office said it immediately convened a meeting of its National Security Council even though there has been no official statement by North Korea, the office of the Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida also confirmed the launch. And former Georgian President Mikhail Saakashvili has been transferred to a private medical facility for treatment today after his health significantly deteriorated in prison following two hunger strikes. His lawyer says his legal team is aware he's been transferred to a clinic in the capital, Tbilisi, but says he's not received any information about his health from the penitentiary service. The 54-year-old was detained in October last year upon returning to Georgia after years of exile to rally the opposition on the eve of local elections. Saakashvili, who implemented pro-Western reforms over nearly a decade in office, was charged in absentia in 2018 with abusing his office during his presidency. These are charges that he says are politically motivated. As the doctors and the public defender of Georgia saying, it's impossible to treat President Saakashvili in Georgia due to the fact that his diseases are in complex, uh, the first time in country, and we don't have any experience. So the um, only way to uh, save his life, and we are talking about uh, humanitarian purpose, not political or legal grounds, he needs to be transferred outside to the um, international center where his complex treatments can be provided. Back here on the continent, a small passenger plane carrying 11 people has crashed in the forest in central Cameroon with rescue efforts underway to locate possible survivors. The cause of the crash and the identity of those on board were not immediately clear. According to local media reports, the aircraft was flying 
from Yaoundé in Simalan Airport to Belabo in the east of the country when air traffic services lost radio contact. According to the transport minister, following an air and ground search, the aircraft was found in a forest not far from Nanga Eboko, around 93 miles northeast of the capital. It did not give details on the victims, but indicated that ground resources are being sent to the rescue. The crash is the first major industry incident reported in Cameroon since 2007, when a Kenya Airways plane carrying 114 people crashed after takeoff from Douala, killing everyone on board. The heatwave continues in India and doctors are concerned about animals there. In a hospital in Ahmedabad, doctors have been injecting fluid into uh, animals. One of them, this parrot, uh, that was almost dehydrated, was one of the thousands of birds that have been affected by the scorching heat wave in the country. Veterinary doctors say rescuers in the western Gujarat state have been picking up dozens of exhausted and dehydrated birds dropping pouts out of trees and the sky every day as the soaring temperature dries out water sources in the state's biggest city. The animal doctors say they've treated thousands of birds in the last few weeks and rescuers keep bringing in dozens of high-flying birds such as pigeons or kites every day. The heat wave has killed more than a dozen people nationwide since late March. And finally, on the program, fashion designer Philip Plain has opened a flagship luxury store in London, accepting payments in cryptocurrencies that change every 10 minutes. The crypto concept store prizes goods in pounds sterling, but also accepts 20 different cryptocurrencies. <laughs> I hear the shop uses QR codes rather than price tags because cryptocurrencies are so volatile and constantly changing. I want to know how much those uh, designer coats cost. They include a studded leather jacket that goes for over 9,000 pounds. That's almost 10,000, actually. Crystal and Crusted sneakers costing 15,630 pounds. I come with a non-refundable to non refundable token, I guess that's what it is, and a baseball cap that's priced at over 1,000 pounds tells you how much you really should be spending in the store. Increased turmoil in cryptocurrency values was sparked by a stampede out of so-called stablecoins, knocking nearly two-thirds of the value of Bitcoin since November and more than halving the price of its small arrival either in the last six months. It actually all started last year in August because we were the first luxury brand in fashion who started to accept cryptocurrencies online, right? And I was very surprised by the big and surprising, let's say, feedback from the market. Because I thought, oh, there's going to be a few freaks who are going to buy, you know, with crypto. But it was completely the opposite. Like, we did last year 100 million turnover online, and 3% was already done with crypto. And we think we can double these numbers this year. Cryptocurrencies are changing all the time. They go up and down, right? And we accept about 25 different currencies. So how do you deal with that issue, right? So every 10 minutes, we try to recalculate the price and update the exchange rate, which will help us to stay always on the right price for the consumer, okay? And that's very challenging, and we do that also in the store. Now, the idea was, how do you do that in a store? You go in a store, and you, when you print a price on a tag, right? You see the price tag? You cannot make it one Bitcoin, because tonight, maybe it's gonna be 1.2 Bitcoins. So we have a QR code, you go with your phone, you scan it, and then, very simple as it is, you see the price which it would cost you today in crypto, right now, right here. And then you can purchase it. And, you know, and that's, that's we want to make it consumer friendly. We want to make it easy for you to buy and to spend products with crypto. Crypto you heard, no, but you heard the bottom line. They're making it easier for you to spend, <laughs> which is the goal of going into such a store. I'm thinking cryptocurrency to be or not to be. I wonder, Millicent, do you have cryptocurrency to spend? <laughs> Thanks for watching. I'm Amarachi Ubani. I'm Millicent Walker. Have a good evening.